Kevin, and tonight we're going to have a program with uh, Joe Greco. I call him Junior, but it's Joe Greco. I'm used to it. And uh, Joe is an expert uh, fisherman, uh, an amazing outdoorsman. I've basically known him his whole life, and um, I, uh, I, I have nothing but huge amounts of respect for him. Um, his ability, Likewise. His abilities are beyond most, uh, uh, much older than he is um, and more experienced, but his experience level is incredible for his age and time. So much time on the water. So he uh, has been guiding for a few years. This year is his first year full time. He, um, second. Well, second, but last year you were still working at your other job China. a little bit. And uh, so tonight's program is going to be about trolling where the fish are. Um, he's going to specifically be talking about the source, but a lot of the information translates up on the part. Um, so uh, without uh, too much further ado, so thank you. Thank you. For Thanks for having me. Program today. And, uh, we look forward to everything you have to say. I know awesome. I'm certainly going to be interested. Okay. Very good. Awesome. Here we go. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, going to definitely, hopefully, give you guys a lot of good information. Um, I definitely appreciate being called an expert. I, didn't, I wouldn't consider myself quite an expert, but uh, we'll get into that and why. Um, Lake George, we'll talk about today. Obviously, that's where I spend most of my time and feel most comfortable um, sharing the knowledge I've learned over the course of really my whole life. Um, I've had it pretty easy, you know. I'm very lucky that I have learned a lot of stuff from my father and his generation of uh, charter boat captains and people that, you know, literally spoon fed me everything I know and most of what I know to this day. And uh, it's just a language that I speak, uh, you know, anything trolling related, I'm familiar with it. And uh, so it comes very naturally to me now. Um, howdy, Mike. Uh, so today, uh, where are the fish? Kind of, I think it's pretty, really open-ended and kind of neat. Um, I kind of threw this thing together last minute, so hopefully I don't ramble too much and it doesn't, you know, look like a cluster. But uh, I think it should be entertaining. Uh, pertaining to Lake George. So the first thing is, uh, where are the fish? I mean, they're in the water, obviously. We know that, right? Um, 80-20, everybody knows the 80-20 rule that uh, 20 per, thank you. Uh, basically, you know, your populations of fish are in small parts of the lake, okay? 80% of your fish are gonna be in 20% of the lake, no matter where you go. Uh, that's generally just the way it is. Uh, most of fishing really boils down to uh, seasonality, knowing your body of water, knowing what the ecosystem is doing at certain times of the year, learning about the species that are in uh, the lake that you're trying to target. And, you know, the more you kind of get in tune with what's going around you, uh, that's what's really going to make you the best fisherman you can be. Um, every day I approach with a, sort of a clean slate. I mean, the thing with fishing is we get on our boats and we go and have the excitement is, you know, we really don't know what's going to happen. We, we really don't know. I mean, that's the whole fun of fishing. We have a pretty good idea of where they're going to be. Uh, we have our stuff all set up the way we want it. We have our lures picked out for the conditions, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, you know, there's always an element of wonder. Uh, so the more you can understand where you're fishing, what you're fishing for, and, and really, that's what really you need to focus on as a fisherman. The lures, the color, the speed, all that other stuff, you know, the fish will tell you all that. Um, but you have to really understand what's going on at certain times of the year. 80-20. Um, this is probably more something for the trolling seminar, uh, but setting up a, the boat. You know, you have to set everything up exactly the way you want it for efficiency, um, you know, from having everything in working order, your releases, everything where they are, where they need to be, how they operate, 
um, all that stuff is going to translate into uh, being able to kind of navigate throughout the day, be mobile, and you have to move two or three times during the day. Uh, that's just something, you know, that's got to come first. Um, so what I'd like to really do is kind of talk about the species that we target, salmon, lake trout, bass, uh, seasonality, and what they do throughout the season. Uh, springtime, ice out, we'll start with that. Uh, everybody gets really into the smelt run. Obviously, when the smelt are, you know, doing their thing, the lake trout are not far by salmon as well. Um, you know, I don't really get too caught up on the smelt run. I, I think, you know, people tend to get in this mindset where, oh, the smelt are running. We got to, now we, now's our time to go and catch a bunch of fish. Uh, I think it can be that way. Um, to me, it's just another part of the season. You know, after the smelt run uh, right now is some really good fishing. The smelt, you know, they don't disappear after the smelt spawn the lake trout. They don't just go into hiding somewhere. They're pretty much in the same areas. They might just be a little deeper and out a little bit further. Um, but, you know, it's just things like that, that we kind of, we get ourselves in these mindsets of, you know, the certain time is the time I got to go. And then after that, I, I just, I'm going to forget about it because I'm not comfortable or whatever. Um, so springtime, uh, smelt run, the fish are all over the place. Uh, I can tell you, you will catch lake trout on the surface. You'll catch them suspended. You'll catch them on bottom. Um, it's a perplexing time. It's also usually a pretty good bite. There's a lot of oxygen in the lake and, you know, it's a good time to just run and gun, get on the shorelines, take off, and you're going to run into some fish eventually. Um, you're still really kind of paying attention to where the bait is, uh, especially, you know, during that spring to summer transition. You know, if you can stay on those smelt schools that are going to be in slightly deeper water, that's where you're going to find your fish. And you're, you're probably going to find a lot of dead water, you know, if you, if you don't find those areas. Um, three different populations of fish always. You got your really deep water fish. <clears throat> you can go out and fish 120 to 150 feet of water. Uh, really any time of the year, there's always fish on bottom with the Cisco schools. Um, you always have your structure fish that are on the humps. Uh, I did a little diagram of Dome Island. Everybody's probably pretty familiar with that area. That's Fish Lake George. And, you know, just to kind of illustrate, you know, I work that area a lot in the summer, not so much right now. You can. Um, I'd rather not run all the way up there. You know, there's plenty of fish down south. I'm out of the village. So, uh, you know, I don't, I try not to travel too far if I don't have to. But uh, what's interesting about that area is that's the deepest water in the lake. And you'll see fish always doing three things out there. They're always going to be on this ledge. There's always fish on bottom out in the basin areas. There's always fish on these humps where you'll see a lot of the guys jigging. Um, there's a lot of little humps out there. And uh, those are those are interesting fish, you know, that are just always there. Um, I can't really say I spend a whole lot of time fishing for them. I know that's where a lot of the jig guys like to go. Uh, but the point is, within this one area, you know, there's a lot of different fish out there doing different things at different times. So, uh, you know, it's, that's a good spot to work any time of the year you want to go and get on some lake trout you'll see a lot of suspension out here in the summertime usually 80 to 110 feet a lot of suspended hooks um, what i think they do out there is those suspended fish are more your lethargic fish they like to they float up and they'll find that there's a really interesting like secondary thermocline there where they'll hit where they're comfortable and just they just kind of hang out there uh, Usually your fish on bottom are your, your feeders, especially when you see them in, with the schools of bait and stuff like that. You know, I think that's what they that's what they do out there, a lot of those deep water fish. Then you have your structure fish that like to hang out on the shelves and the humps. And uh, it's really just kind of interesting, you know. 
They're always doing different things. Um, in the springtime, you, you know, there's just little pockets of fish you'll stumble on in different areas that are active. Um, and a lot of times we're just covering water and we're looking for our first couple bites of the day and oftentimes pay attention to that. You might not mark a ton of fish, but uh, you know, there will probably be more than you think in that area because they're always moving. Um, you know, you might go through every pass, uh, there's this little sweet spot, you'll mark five, six fish or something like that. And that's just on your run, but there's probably fish like that all over in that entire patch that you're working because um, they're always moving around. So that that's a good tip in the springtime is, you know, really pay attention to those little pockets of fish that you find um, if you choose to work slightly shallower areas. Shallower, you know, I'm talking 30 to 70 feet. Um, I'd much prefer to fish shallow all the time if I can, instead of working 150 feet, it's just easier. A uh, lot less gear you have in deep water. You're not bringing the fish up, you know, such an extreme depth. Uh, is there a reason you just why don't need to. Be, is there a reason why they would be in that, like the shallower areas versus the... Uh, you know, I think there's just certain fish that they like to be shallow and they live their entire lives in slightly shallower water. I think there's fish that live in deep water all the time. Um, you know, I'm sure there's some monster fish that are down in that deep water that just no one really fishes that deep, you know. Generally, the Lakers, they really don't like to be any deeper than about 120, 130 in Lake George. You'll, you'll kind of notice the mature fish kind of peter out as you get deeper than that. Um, that really deep water that holds a lot of the juvenile bait, a lot of the juvenile Lakers, they kind of blend in with the bait. And that's kind of a nursery for this entire lake is that Dome Island area, I think. Um, if you go through there religiously, try to fish that deep, deep water. I'm talking deeper than 150 feet. Uh, you're going to catch a ton of little fish and it's just going to drive you nuts. They hang up, they just, you know, follow all your lines up. And uh, there's probably some huge fish down there with them, but I don't know. Years ago, you know, growing up, uh, with my father fishing, I mean, we used to get a ton of big, big fish, over 20 pounds. Um, I just don't think they're really here anymore, you know. Uh, but we never used to fish very deep, you know. And I, people tell me all the time, all kinds of, you know, you got to use big lures and you got to do this and that. And you got to use a 12-inch sucker. And let me tell you, of all the big, big fish that we've caught years ago, that's just not the case, you know. Um, from our experience, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that's the be all end all to it, but, uh, it's interesting. Um, so probably the trickiest time, um, I find in the lake is right now, uh, till about the first week of June, that's that transition. Um, you know, you can be in one area. For a couple of days, you might get a huge warm front that comes in and it's 85 for two or three days and all of a sudden the surface temps are climbing. Uh, that's You really got to pay attention to what's going on. Um, that can just suddenly shift everything. You know, they can shift the fish deeper, different areas. Uh, there's definitely migrations of fish doing things on a large level. I notice um, the very southern basin Southern Basin, I'm referring to, you know, north of just north of the village in that big 100 foot basin. There's periods that bite gets really hot for Lakers. There's periods they move out of there. Um, mid to late August, I find it slows down in the village. There's still some fish there. Uh, and they just, I think a lot of them just keep moving north. Uh, I really believe that. I think these fish move around a lot more than we think. Um, but there's just, there's a lot of lake trout in Lake George, so it's, it's hard to say one way or, or the other. Um, but uh, May can be tricky, and definitely once that water temp gets 
in my mind, surface temp 65, 63, you know, you're really starting to look at more of a bottom oriented bite in a lot of suspended fish. Um, and again, structure fish, there's fish on structure all year. I don't think that's, you know, you, you can go out there all the time and find them. This is more of this information I think is pertaining to trolling. Um, and, you know, trying to find isolated schools of fish in different areas of the lake. When do you find the thermocline? Uh, you know, the thermocline really is an interesting thing. And we'll get into the salmon thing in a little bit, but like, depending on how hot it is, certain times of the spring, early summer, you might have a band of water that's the same temperature 20 feet down and then it breaks in late May. Um, it might get really hot in May and then all of a sudden you have temperature down 40 feet. Uh, it really can vary. The lake generally sets up pretty solid where you get to a point where it's just the top, you know, 40, 50 feet, sometimes 60. Um, it's like bath water and just devoid of oxygen and there's not a whole lot happening up there. That's really my favorite time of the year. Um, you just eliminate half the lake but the thermocline is an interesting thing and this time of year if you really pay attention you'll find there's bands of water that develop especially when we have these constant cold fronts that keep coming in you know you'll have a little band of warm water pay attention to it because there'll be fish cruising under it but you know you wouldn't ordinarily think that because that's that's kind of a rare thing you know normally may to June, that transition, it, it sets up in a certain way and you kind of have the same, see the same things every year. But uh, that's a really good question. Temperature is just really, you know, more of a salmon thing, but for Lakers, it's really important also. And, you know, you can, you can do temperature fishing on structure and stuff like that, like they do for Browns on Ontario. Uh, if you pay attention to where that thermal fine is up on shore, you'll always find fish like that. Um, I think Lake Trout get that reputation of just being the bottom dwellers that are always in cold water, but they're, you know, they, they will tolerate low 50s even in the springtime. You'll see them up on the surface when it's 55 once in a while for, if there's food there, you know. So. How about wind? We just had a week of wind. Yep. Um, Weather is actually my next bullet point. Wind is a huge thing. Um, weather is probably the biggest thing I consider every day um, because I know just you get doing this every day. You know, you see the pattern, uh, especially for some reason on Lake George, really prone to a slow bite with a cold north wind. Um, if it's muggy, you know, 70s for a week, and then all of a sudden you get a 30 degree north wind temperature drop. Call your people and tell them it's probably going to be tough. It's going to be windy. It's going to be cold. Uh, those are days I'll catch 10 or 15 fish, and half of them come off. Or they got one prong in the skin of their lip. You know, conversely, you get a nice warm front, low pressure comes in, and they're just inhaling it. Uh, it's just the way it is, you know, the fish are extremely barometer sensitive to pressure and, uh, wind, the other point with the wind, definitely look for pockets where the wind's been blowing bait around. It's been blowing warm water around. Um, if you pay attention to where you're marking pods of bait, it's almost always where the wind was blowing the past couple of days. Definitely huge and very overlooked on these smaller lakes, Lake Ontario. It's biblical, those guys that wind direction, they're looking for water coloration, bait, blah, blah, blah. And the kind of people I think maybe forget about that on the smaller lakes, but it's just as important for sure. Uh, and the, the, the weather thing, you know, if there's days, I get it, you have the weekend off, you're going fishing, if it's gonna be bad or not. But, uh, you know, doing this full time, you know, you just got to do it and you got to figure out how to catch the fish. A lot of times that means downsizing. Um, 
maybe fish in deeper water those days. It's a little bit more stable down there than up top where they might feel that pressure change a little more. Uh, those are things to consider. But uh, it's, it's really interesting, especially if you're new to fishing. You know, you might have a great day and you just pick the wrong day to fish the next day. And then you're like, what the heck? I'm, I did everything I did yesterday. And why didn't I catch any? Or it was a slow day or whatever. Weather is just critical. So if you pay attention to that, that'll help you navigate through everything, you know, as you're going along. Um, salmon. Um, love targeting the salmon. I think they're, you know, they're just a blast to catch. Acrobatic. Um, they can be challenging. I think they have this reputation on Lake George for being this mysterious unicorn fish that's hard to catch. They're really not hard to catch. Um, they're hard to find. There's just not a lot of them. Uh, if there were as many salmon around as there are lake trout and it was vice versa, people would probably be wondering where the lake trout are. You know, it's, they're just not hard to catch. They're hard to find. Uh, they're definitely very target specific, especially on this lake. Um, there will be, I could have an eight rod spread out. If I get on a good salmon bite, the fish are going to pick one thing out and you might as well just take everything else off. I mean, that I will say about the salmon. Um, the, they can be frustrating from that perspective. They're also they have a very short life cycle. The different uh, year classes that they put in, I'm convinced, will like different things. I mean, we'll have a smoke and lure one year, uh, buy a case of them because they're so hot, and then you can't catch a fish on them the next year. I don't get it. I was just thought, I was down at JJ's the other night, and I got a bunch of old stuff off of him. And um, we always used to laugh at that because it's just, it makes no sense, but it's just, I don't know what it is. It's hilarious. Um, aside from that, you know, the salmon really, uh, they're not really that hard to catch. There's just not that many of them, you know? So uh, springtime, I don't fish for them a whole lot. Um, I know they're shallow. You know, they do weird stuff. They might be, I've caught them down 35 feet when, I think they're on the surface. Um, they go into little bays and little pockets of water that's probably warmer than the rest of the lake that really make them difficult and unaccessible. Um, there's just not enough of them where I'm going to sacrifice, you know, too much time because you just burn the clock. And uh, the, the water in this lake, it's just so gin clear. You got to have the right conditions in the springtime. Um, definitely the salmon chop, you know, they like that surface disturbance. Those cloudy rainy days are when you want to chase your salmon. Um, but in the springtime, I don't know, I, I just don't spend too much time on them until, you know, you can start eliminating a lot of that water in the lake a little bit. Um, that's when we seem to have our best success. Salmon, uh, typical locations in the summer, anywhere. Uh, oftentimes we're really trying to look for little pods of bait. We're trying to look for food sources. It might be bugs. Um, you, you know, you might see hatches of bugs coming up. You might see uh, a bloom of juvenile smell, uh, something. Usually they're, they'll key in on that very quickly. Um, I like to compare them to a bluefin tuna. You know, they're a pelagic fish. They're not relating to anything other than maybe temperature. And when you find them, they're there for the day. You better pay attention to where they are. And tomorrow, they're going to be 300 yards from that spot. You know, if you can get on a good pot of salmon, which is hard nowadays, they're just, they're few and far. Um, you know, you just really got to put a lot of diligence into finding them. And then when you hit one, pay attention because you just probably did something right. And it, at that point, it's recreating and understanding why they're there, you know, it's, they're tricky, um, but they're really not that hard to catch. It's more of, you got to get in the mindset of, I'm going to spend the whole day today and try to catch salmon, you know. Um, 
So when you charge the fee switch? You will. Is, uh, it, is, it, is it possible to determine when you're charged? Uh, oh, what? I don't know. That could be later in the system. Not always. Uh, the biggest issue lately has been the smallmouth bass. Um, I mean, we catch a ton of the smallmouth, and it's just frustrating. You know, it's 60, 70, 80 feet. You think you got a nice salmon on, and it's a freaking four pound smallmouth, which is cool. I mean, it's fun for people. But uh, that is really the hardest thing that for me lately has been just I don't know why the bass are suspending so much like they are. It's never really used to be that big of a thing years ago. Um, but now there's time periods where it's just incessant. And uh, aside from that, I mean, it, you, you know, you will mark them if you really have a good year of, you know, two and three year old fish, you get on a good pot and you're catching, you know, half a dozen a day or something. You'll, you'll know when you're into them. Um, I'll tell you what I see a lot salmon wise is you're going to see a lot of little bay pods and you know, if you pay attention to those and you're, you're seeing this, those are generally salmon or bass. Okay. Um, those are just little hooks from the sonar. Yeah, it's kind of small, but it will appear small. Um, so yeah, you, you'll, you'll mark them, you know, Lakers are obviously more obvious of a hook, but, re but lately what it's been is, is the bass. I mean, I've, I've had, Days where it's just we catch like 10, 12 bass, and then we're like, let's just let's go freaking catch lake trout, you know. And another telltale with the, the bass, you know, salmon, so many times they hit, bang, and they jump two or three times, gone. Bass, I could drag them all the way up to the Sagamore from the village. You never lose one, you know. I don't know why, but. Uh, not to take away from bass, I think they're a great fish. I love bass fishing, it. but uh, frustrating when you're trying to find salmon. They're just not there. Um, so the salmon, you know, fall. The way I approach the entire season for salmon is my favorite time of year is summer. Obviously, you're eliminate a lot of the water. They're down there deeper. Sometimes they're real deep. Um, we had one year we were catching them in with the Cisco schools, 150 feet down. Nobody believed me. I'm telling you, 150 feet down, old suspended. Uh, they'd hit, and you'd see the line go skyrocket out of the water. You know, from down 150 feet, pretty cool. But uh, there's just little things that you'll pick up on, you know, as you get into it that they're an interesting fish. They'll do weird things. Um, you'll stumble onto a pattern. It'll last a week or a couple weeks and then they'll disappear or they'll move or something. So summer's a good time. That's your, that's your time of stability really in the lake altogether. Your fish are generally from, you know, mid to late July until uh, turnover. You know, they're all pretty much doing the same thing. Um, and winter is the same way. Ice, you know, during ice season, the fish generally, they move around, of course, but uh, there's somewhat, there's stability there. The water's all the same temperature, you know. So you can eliminate that whole factor. Um, the salmon, it, it, one thing I will say, uh, you have a really good pre-spawn bite in the summertime. When they start to get into that spawn mode mid-September, um, that's when a lot of the guys will see them around the docks and stuff. They just get weird and, you know, you can still catch them. But uh, landlocks also, <clears throat> they're not an every year spawner. They're not an everyday feeder. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. Um, so what you'll have is, you know, 50% of your fish or, or whatever, you'll still have fish that are in the lake all throughout the fall. A lot of your fish are in breeding or doing their mock spawn thing, but you know, don't think all the salmon are, are going into spawn. That's just not true. 
um, that's, that's kind of when it slows down, you know, as far as I'm concerned. And then it's more about getting, getting around the brook mounts and, you know, the fly guys are doing their thing in the brooks. Um, so that's, that's pretty much the whole salmon thing. Post spawn salmon. I'm talking November, December. Uh, that's when you start hearing about the guys up on Champlain doing the frostbite fishing in their boats, you know, in January. That's, that can be some of the best fishing of the year also because the lake's all set up for ice. It's cold. The fish are all up top. Typically, you would think so. Um, and that first ice early, you know, late winter is a really good bite, beating up for winter. So uh, that's... Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Will they move eventually? Yes and no. If you're referring to those broodstock fish. You just repeated Oh, yeah. Uh, so Mike's question was the, the fish that were recently stocked, um, which they put two different kinds in. They put the broodstock fish in from the federal fisheries, uh, which are a low population, big breeding class fish. And they put the regular salmon fingerlings in. Uh, the fingerling fish, you, you, I don't think they go very far. And I don't think a lot of them survive. I think they put them in too small. Um, I've had lake trout chasing them, ones that I've hooked by accident, reeling them in. I do think they get, I think they're just feeding the lake. There's a ton of birds around now, cormorants and the gulls get them. And it just, I think they need to put fewer in and bigger, or they need to do like a pen program and feed them and let them mature before they release them or else it's just, it's a waste of money is my, that's my opinion. Uh, the broodstock fish, they almost don't act like a salmon. I mean, they're much less picky. They'll, you'll catch them on a lot of different kinds of things. Um, you'll have fish, they'll stay around where they release them, a lot of them. I don't think they know any better. Um, but you'll also have some of them that they'll move out and they'll kind of adapt into a regular lake salmon. They'll find temperature and they'll feed and everything like that. Um, so that's a good question. But yeah, we'll, those fish are weird. We'll, you know, we'll be like fishing at 80 feet of water and we'll catch one on bottom. Um, you'll catch them on the surface. You'll, it's just, they do weird stuff. Um, the regular lake salmon kind of, if you follow them through their age classes, they'll, they pretty much do the same thing together. You'll find they're, they're definitely schooled up always, you know. Quick question for you, Joe. It might Shoot. be a little off topic, but it's just, uh, any word on the Lake George Fishing Alliance? I have a group of anglers interested in helping restart that. Do you have any? I, I can't answer that question. So, I'll... Take it away. Yeah, oh, you got it. The, the Lake George Fishing Alliance um, went away three years ago, so it's not really a thing anymore. So if, if it is that you want to start it back up, um, with uh, JJ, Jeff Johnson, uh, who's been keeping it going. Actually, 20 years ago, it was Joe Sr. and myself that started it. Um, maybe 25 years ago. It was a long time ago. Uh, we got it started and then, you know, we evolved and it did, we did well. We got the, uh, the uh, Lawrenceburg hatchery to put the bigger boots on, um, fish into the lake. And we did the smelt, replanting uh, smelt mats in because the smelt population crashed in the lake. We got the smelt back into the lake from Spoon Lake. Um, and so we did a bunch of good things, but the Alliance itself is not a thing anymore. And so what we're trying to do, if, you, if somebody wanted to start it again, they could start a new group. I'm sure that the old group will be there if you use the same name. I actually have the original banner here, um, but it isn't anything anymore. It was a nonprofit organization. Uh, they're welcome to use our facility for meetings, whoever this is. Um, I know that the Alliance was uh, instrumental in the uh, King George fishing tournament in the fall. Um, so if you 
lot of reasons why it isn't taking place anymore. And whoever it is who asked the question, if they'd like to talk to me about it, I'd be happy to uh, have another time. Okay? That's the answer on a lot of people. Okay. So get in touch with you if they want to talk more. If, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not a bad idea. You know? I think it'd be good. I think there's definitely the lake can be better in a lot of ways, you know, but uh, discussion for another time, I guess, you know. Um, so I got another quick question for you. Shoot. Uh, I think it was actually in your father's seminar. We're talking about the Christmas trees. Yep. Says uh, several times trolling Christmas trees. Can you describe what that rig is? Yes. Christmas trees. Uh, you can get them at Walmart. They usually have them out around uh, November 1st or so. Artificial uh, or real. Uh, they're lovely to decorate for the children. You know, Christmas trees, uh, cowbells. Guys call them gangs, Christmas trees, cowbells. We call them jewelry. Got to get the jewelry out today. Um, we love them. We hate them. You know, they're a necessary evil. Uh, certain days and certain times of the year. Okay, so this is Joe's favorite tree, which is not made anymore. Last one, he didn't scarf it up because he didn't see it. Okay. This is Joe's favorite. It's called the Sun Flash by Les Davis. And when I found a whole bunch of these a couple of years ago, um, he bought them all. <laughs> Almost. Uh, yeah. And to be honest with you, I try not to run those. Well, it's, it's heavy yeah, on it's your line. It's yeah, heavy on your lines. Do. It's a it's a super effective way to fish. It produces a lot of fish, um, and I, I'm going to jump in here and work with him a little bit on this. People out there. Um, so this is a tree. This is the front. This is the back, and then you tie a leader off to your bait. And the whole idea behind a tree is that. This blade rocks like this, okay? If the blade's spinning like this, you're going too fast. The whole idea is the, the blades rock. It looks like a school of bait fish, very effective. And your bait's behind it. The, the whole idea behind this thing is to uh, attract the fish in to it and then hit your bait, which is behind it, your whatever lure you put on there. Pretty accurate there, Joe. Yeah. Okay, so there's the, this is what we use to pull. Um, the whole thing with these is they're very speed uh, oriented. And how I describe to people what to do with these is you got to go slow. And they say, well, how slow is slow? Well, I just explained that we want this blade rocking, so we've got to go at least that slow. But basically, you go as slow as you possibly can go, and you're going too fast. That's how you fish with these. You know, you got to be, barely be moving. So these are obsolete, which was the favorite for years and years and years. And unfortunately, uh, uh, Les Davis stopped making them. So this is the most popular thing that we have now. It's made by Hammerhead, a local company out of Rochester. Well, not too local, but New York State local. Um, Jim Piano is the guy that owns it. And, and the nice thing about this setup is this is a very light uh, aluminum uh, blade. So it weighs much less than that. It does the same thing with less drag on your line. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sorry to interrupt, Joe. We've really gotten more into you know, hammerheads. Yeah. The hammerheads because they're just lighter. There's less drag. Uh, you get a fish on these, and it's a lot, a lot more fun to fight. You can go a little bit faster. Uh, we run all kinds of stuff behind these. Obviously, flatfish are a favorite on Lake George. Um, spinning lows thick baits, uh, all different kinds of plugs and stuff. You can run behind these and have fun with it. I mean, the lake trout, you know, you could just, just about run anything you want behind these. You're going to catch some fish. I mean, guys tell me they, they run all kinds of stuff behind them, which I don't, and they catch fish on them. So Ruin did we answer that question? Yes. I okay. said so you'd use drift socks with that. Yeah. If you need to, uh, if you have a kicker, you know, if you're propelled by a big boat, a lot of the old school charter boats that ran big inboards, um, 
you know, they couldn't go slow enough for these and they just, you know, they just decided not to run them. A lot of people just hate running these. I don't like running them. I mean, they're just not fun. You're, you got to watch out for bottom. Uh, it's more fun fighting fish on light tackle and light line. Uh, like JJ, for example, he just never would run these. He just hated it. He didn't need to. He was good at catching them suspended. Um, there are days and there are time periods when you're not going to find anything better than those. Uh, pretty much like late summer when the fish get real lethargic and real tough, you know, that's, that's our go-to. So, and we'll talk about all that stuff in my summer seminar. We'll get into the nuts and bolts of all that stuff because there's quite a bit to it. Um, so yeah, that's the Christmas tree thing. see what else we got here trolling versus jigging um, jigging is probably the most efficient deadly way to find fish you know you with the spot lock trolling motors now I mean you just cruise over structure look for fish drop the thing down and you're playing video games with fish um, you know, if somebody's really new to lake trout fishing, I would suggest doing that. Trolling, you know, there's just so many other different ways to do things, and it's it really can be overwhelming to just get into it and say, you know, how fast, how far back, how this, that, what kind of lure. Um, if you really want to get into the trolling game, I tell people, you know, you know, the first thing people do, they get on my boat and they want to learn. And they Look at all my lures. And, you know, within that lure pad, there's seven different kinds of spoons. They all require different speeds. I like certain ones at different times of the year. Um, I had a guy fish with me last year, and he took pictures of everything and got everything. And he's like, I, I went out the next day, and we didn't catch anything. Well, that was the next day. You know, it, it, everything changes. Um, but I always tell people, you know, Come in here. If you're going to get into trolling and you want to learn how to fish spoons, buy one kind of spoon, buy every color they have, and learn how to fish that one spoon because they're all very speed dependent, and that's really the whole the whole idea behind it. Um, so you know the the trolling jigging thing is that's a really kind of a big conversation. And again, this is just what we do. Um, the stuff that I run is what I run. I mean, I have people fish with me and they tell me they catch fish on all kinds of stuff that I would never use or I don't think would work, but it does. Um, the, one of the really interesting things about fishing in general is you have your confidence base. There's things that work for certain people that don't work for other people. When you find out they're using that, you want to try it. Um, me and my father go back. Obviously, we talk every day. He's on the other end of the lake. I'm like, they are just crushing this, uh, you know, purple DB smell. You got to put one on. He runs it all day, doesn't catch a fish. On. <laughs> and I mean, this is all the time. Uh, we have different kind, colors, flat fish that we run that he can't catch a fish on up there. I run down here and it's just deadly. Chew the paint right off it till it's white and I throw them in the garbage and buy new ones. I, I don't know. It's, so you're really, you, you got to just pick something. Get a whole line of whatever that lure is and figure out what works for you. That's my suggestion. And develop confidence in that one thing instead of, you know, it's so easy. Oh, this guy, he's he's getting uh getting them on repellents. And then you go buy it and then you use it and then you don't catch anything on it. And then oh this guy's he told me he's using dodgers and flies. And then you get that set up and you run that for a couple days. That didn't really work. And before you know it, you just you know, it's so the thing with trolling is keep it simple, especially on Lake George. Um, you ever use crazy Ivan spoons on Lake George? Uh, yeah, there's a couple that I run, but generally that's not one of my go-tos. Um, I think that he's got some great patterns, but uh, quite honestly, the amount of stuff I already have, you know, that I bought that has been given to me, my father's got tons and tons of boxes of all different kinds of spoon you could ever imagine. 
uh, when something new comes out, I sometimes I don't try it. You know, I just I already have so much stuff that I haven't tried yet. You know, I mean, all those new moose looks that are out there. There's a lot of great moose looks I already have, but we were talking about that one the other day. It's it's like it's got to catch fish. You know, so uh, that the Ivans are not really one of my go tos, honestly. But I think they're a good spoon. I'm not saying they're not. Um, I could go on and on with lures and just things. I have buddies that are awesome fishermen and they use completely different stuff than I do. You know, they have their stuff that works for them. And oftentimes I don't even want to know what they're using because once I get that in my head, I'm going to start running that stuff. It might not work. Or, you know, you're, I tend to take information with a grain of salt. I don't, I think it makes you a better fisherman to learn all that stuff on your own. Um, find out what works for you on your boat. And I don't really worry too much about anything other than that. What about how important is a terminal tackle, ball swivels and such? Ball Definitely, swivels. especially uh, once you start going above 2.5 to 2.8, you're gonna spin a lot and you're gonna put good ball bearing swivels, uh, Sampo. You're saying speed, 2.5, 2.8, yeah. Yeah. Um, and the AFW stuff, Jeff carries both of it, can get both of it. The thing with ball bearing swivels, buy the best ones. You know, it's not like you're going to lose a whole bunch of them. Get the, it really counts. So, good, good question. In uh, Lake George, I cannot stress enough. Smaller, everything finesse, the smallest possible everything. You're going to catch more fish. It's clear, uh, very clear water. Um, you know, I see guys come out from Lake Ontario and they got 20 pound tests on and the big swivels this long. They put their spoons on that are this long. You know, that's completely different from out here. So if you do that, downsize everything, it, it really, it makes a big difference. Uh, good question. How about scent, he said? Yeah. I'll tell you what I do. I have all different kinds of it. Um, I have days where I'll use it, and then I'll have days where I don't, and I don't think it makes a difference at all. Uh, what it does is it makes my sandwich in the middle of the day taste like smelt. <laughs> so I try not to use it. Uh, I don't think with, you know, necessarily what we do, it really makes that big of a difference. I don't. Um, with the trolling you're saying? I just, I've had phenomenal days using it. And I've had phenomenal days not using it. You think it's and then I've had a really it? slow time of the year, you know, maybe where we're really, really working hard for fish. And <laughs> I'll use it and I'm still working really hard for fish. And then I'll have days where I crush them the next day and I'm like, oh, I forgot to use scent today. It, it's just such a, it's inscrutable, you know. Uh, guys will tell you that it's, you have to have it. But, uh, yeah, so the question was, do I use scents? I do, uh, but I don't think I need to. I guess that's the long and short of it. Guys will tell you they swear by it, and I'm not trying to say that they're wrong, and there's probably guys sitting at home thinking there's a whole bunch of stuff that I, I'm saying that that's not correct. This is all just my experience. Um, I don't think it can hurt, uh, but I can tell you day in and day out of using it, not using it, it's just. I, you can repeat this. I think that those individual scents on your lures, why you don't have to put it on every day. So you're always putting that trap on. Yeah. Um, like I, there's probably an expert somewhere that's like, you, you need to use the scent. But I don't know. I can tell you this. If I have three lures in the water, and the fish are biting the same one over and over and over again. Whether I have scent on that lure or not, it's not, it's, you know what I mean? It's just, it's very, they're very target specific and they're looking for something that look, looks natural to them in the conditions is, is what it, I think. Uh, dark day, dark colors, light day, light colors. Why does that make sense? Because you're envisioning 
the darkness of a, of a lake on a gloomy, cloudy day, and something blaze pink comes by, I don't think that looks as natural as like a dark green, black, or brown. On sunny days, conversely, that you can you notice it when you're snorkeling. It's just everything's illuminated down there. You see something black go by, and it sticks out like a sore thumb. You see something silver, orange, you know, light green. That looks very natural. You know, it's so that's kind of what I think. That's just my own personal how I think about it. But uh, you think it's possible that with the 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 scent thing, like because they're reacting so fast versus like with something like jigging is like they they can kind of come up to it and kind of like look and smell and do, do all that versus like with trolling, they're just kind of like they see it and they come after it. You know, I what do. I mean? there's not really that. Exactly what I think. And I also think, you know, most of it doesn't really, it's just not natural. It doesn't smell. It smells like old rotten fish. You know, you smell a fresh smell for a Cisco. It smells like cucumbers. Uh, EJ's scent, his smell oil is really nice. It's a very natural, you know, I use that fat, fat sauce and, it, and it's one of the, one of the, I really will say that his product, it's, it's very natural and he didn't make it try to smell like old fish. You know, a lot of them just smell like that. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting topic. I mean, I know. You know, I have a lot of obviously fishing buddies, charter captain buddies. Um, some use it and swear by it. Other guys, uh, like Rick and Jackie from uh, Crazy Yankee, never use the scent. He's one of the best fishermen out there. He says he he just he likes to eat when he's on the boat. He doesn't want to have freaking smell paste all over his fingers or anchovy, whatever they use out there. So I, it's interesting. Erwin says the competition brand swivels are expensive but seem to be worth it. And he says WD forty question mark. I don't know. WD forty. Uh there's there's a wipe tail behind it. You know, I have a bottle I keep on my boat, and once in a while, you know, it's the kind of thing. Where if we're if it's a hot bite and we're whacking a lot of fish, I'll be like, watch this. I already know it's probably going to catch a fish. But we do it just because it's a show out there. You know what I mean? Um, WD-40 is deep. I've heard that. You're not supposed to. Yeah. It does work. My, 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 my uh, I will say that i i mean we don't use a lot of it but anytime you're putting any kind of motor in this in that lake there's already a whole bunch of crap going oh, into it two it's strokes it's and no, no reason to add more right no for in pristine bodies of water where, where motors aren't allowed yeah you know, like but it's it's archaic and i mean it's there's a plenty of other better stuff you could be using than wd-40 but it's definitely there's a good tail behind it a lot of guys, a lot of guys swear by it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I don't know. Same thing with the banana thing. I mean, I don't know. I've had some pretty bad days with bananas when I brought them. So, um, <laughs> electronics, you know, finding fish, obviously electronics are a game changer. I put that PS30 transducer on this year and oh my, I got to tell you, it can. can optics. Yeah. But the transducer for trolling is the PS30, and a lot of guys don't realize they need that specific transducer. Um, but game changer, you know, you can actually, it gives you a visual of what, where your spread is. Can't say enough about it. You can see fish interacting, you know, with your different colored weights, and it's really cool. Um, trusting your electronics is just huge. And at, the more you use them, the more you'll be able to recognize what a, a school of smelt looked like versus a school of juvenile perch versus a school of cisco versus uh individual cisco versus you know what do lake trout hooks look like um it, all those things are really our bible out there when we need to find fish in a hurry uh so definitely trust your electronics buy them from 
there's 307. Please don't order them from some company that you're never going to get any kind of customer service from. Yes. When they have an issue, which hopefully they won't, but they do. Yeah. There's always a percentage. But uh, well, speaking of that's like my sales pitch on that. But no, I've every any time I've ever had an issue, it it's taken care of. Um, any comment about like, I guess budget type of electronics? Yeah. Some guys well, just can't afford yeah. twelve hundred, sixteen hundred dollars. Yeah, budget. And you know, do you have a recommendation? Yes. A comment on so the question is. So the question is. What, about, what, what do I get my most bang for my buck for electronics without breaking the bank? Um, that's a good, really good question with an all encompassing question with all this stuff. You know, you don't need to spend a fortune. Um, Jeff told me this a million times, the amount of technology you can get now for a few hundred dollars would have cost you thousands years ago. Um, great units. Garmin, Garmin, in my opinion, I love the Garmin stuff. It's just, you know, the amount of feng shui with all the different transducers, uh, their mapping is awesome. Um, the, I think it's the, like the SV series, you know, three, $500, depending on how big of a screen you want. I mean, that is just an unbelievable unit that will accommodate all different kinds of transducers. So. But they, you know, a lot of the electronics and stuff that's just like so out of control, you know, with the 12 inch screens, and, which is awesome. I think it's great. It's cool. But uh, don't let that interfere with intuition and just, you don't need any of that stuff for the most part. You know, when I was a kid, the best fisherman on the lake used to roll up and you know, 16 foot boats with manual downriggers. And I mean, those guys were fishermen. We just catch them now. I mean, if you can't catch fish with all this technology and YouTube and, you know, it's unbelievable. Shiloh says, great presentation. Thank you, sir. Captain, heavy metal. Do you know Shiloh? Yeah. Awesome fisherman. Uh, yeah, anybody, I don't know if anybody has any other questions. Erwin says, great presentations. Our last two falls have been tough salmon fishing, great information, trophy, lake trout fishery. Yeah. So, smelt population, think it's at an all-time high? Question mark. Yeah. I mean, from everything that I see and everyone I've talked to, I've got a lot of good smelt reports. Um, the question you know, our biggest question with Lake George is why are these salmon not surviving? Um, you know, it's a great fishery. It's a, it's, I think the biologists feel that they're just so happy that they don't have to stop lake trout in it. They don't want to tip the scales with anything else. I mean, it'd be awesome if they put something else in there, browns, rainbows. Um, but we, they've said they, they just don't want to like upset the apple cart with the lake trout population. I don't know. Um, we're happy with it. I think it's a, it's an amazing lake trout fishery. Wild populations of lake trout. I wish the salmon would do better. I think they got to put them in bigger. They're just, you know, there's no way that the fish that are this big are. And I don't know what they used to do years it's ago. Get eaten, you think, or what? Um, I think a lot of things have changed. I think there's way more bird predation. With the cormorants and stuff, it's the same thing that's going on on Lake Champlain. Um, I think the, they're just feeding the lake, putting them in that small. I wish they'd put in less and put them in bigger. You know, they put 30,000 salmon in the lake. Where do they go? You know, maybe they if they put in 10,000 and they let them get a little bigger in the hatchery, we'd have maybe 8,000 salmon instead of putting 30,000 in, and then you end up with two or 300 that you got to stumble on. You know, so... I don't know. That's my opinion. They're getting eaten by the whales in the lake. They could be. <laughs> or maybe it's the Lake George monster. And he's got a tenacity for salmon. But uh, yeah, other than that, um, it's a great lake. It's a very, it can be a perplexing lake. Um, 
interesting place. Back to our time. Are you, um, do you primarily want to see what kind of people you go <laughs> bus or would it be side, side view? Uh, I kind of, I have uh, always. We can't hear it. Oh, okay. Um, the question is, yeah, sorry. How do I set my electronics up on the boat, basically? Well, so we don't run mates. You know, that's a large difference that you will see on our boats versus like the Lake Ontario guys, because they almost all of them run mates. So they have a guy driving. The, whoever's the captain and driving the boat, they're oftentimes responsible for paying attention to speed. You know, they kind of have their own setup up front. We have all that stuff in the back. So we're controlling our own speed. We run the autopilots. Um, always traditional sonar going. And the newest addition is the pan optics trolling transducer. Very easy to set up. Um, you just set it up as you would any other transducer. You can adjust everything right on there. You can adjust the angle of it. So, you know, if you're running your spoons way back, you can angle it back. You can, it's just awesome. So easy. Uh, so that's how we set everything up. Fish hawk somewhere, obviously. Uh, I'll tell you right now on Lake George, there's not ever really too much current. It's not like Lake Ontario where, you know, those guys, they might have a four mile an hour current down where they're fishing and they're, they're only going, you know, 0.8 on the surface or something like that. It's, those guys have a lot more variables than we do from that perspective. But uh, that's pretty much how we set up our electronics. Pretty standard. And, uh, you know, if, if you can just get yourself a nice sonar unit, you're ahead of the game. That's all you really use. Quite honestly, the pan optics, you know, it's a luxury, but you can see a lot of that same stuff on your regular sonar unit if you set it up right. Um, I usually will always kick out my transducer a little bit higher. Um, and you'll, you'll see the same, it's not in real time per se, but you'll, you'll still kind of see the same kind of things that you will on the pan optics. Um, just, just not the same depiction. So, and you know, like my Garmin, uh, forget what transducer it is. It's, it's awesome. I can run over the entire basin of the lake and I can mark bait as I'm going along 25 miles an hour. And that's no joke. And I mean, I, I'll oftentimes go out and I'll see, oh, there's all the bait. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's just really amazing what, what's out there. And I'm not overly techy with that kind of stuff. I, I don't consider myself like a whiz with any of that. I keep it pretty basic. And you're still, when you're running your climbing bar, able to pick up? Uh, not really. You know, the, the PS30, you know, it'll, you might be able to catch your divers on there, but uh, it's mostly for your downrigger weights. But it gives you a really good depict where they are in reference to bottom if you are bottom fishing. And it, what it also does, you'll really be able to see the mood of the fish because you'll just see the blobs moving around. And you'll, certain day on a slow day, you'll just, you can just tell they're, they're not, they might just be coming up off bottom and back down really good bite days you're they're right on your balls and they're hawking it's cool it really is it's a game changer sorry i was was it the balls <laughs> yeah honking at the balls yeah come on Pete, let's keep it pg okay <laughs> uh yeah that's pretty much all i got guys uh i got one more quick question for you uh senior was saying that with as far as like where the fish are as far, one of the key things to to study is not so much just the fish and where they're at, but also studying what they're eating. If you find out what they're eating is where you're going to find For sure. Fish. I mean, for sure. That wasn't really, I guess it was just looking for a combination yeah. more than a question. You know, was. the lake trout too, uh, especially on Lake George, I've noticed very similar to a walleye thing. They're, the bigger fish are smart. They know that they can go into some of these shallower areas, low light conditions. And they can find food they get what they want and they're out of there and you know i'll catch a fish 
I don't kill a lot of fish, but if I fillet a fish that I caught on bottom in July at 120 feet of water and it's got bluegills in its belly, obviously, right? It wasn't in 120 feet of water, you know, maybe earlier in the day or the day before. So they definitely they know how to find food and they they do different things. And yeah, you can definitely say, wow, there's a bluegill in its belly. You know, why is that fish going into bluegill zone in July when it's 75 degrees up there you know and, and it's that whole area is 75 degree water it's bizarre but do you really enjoy flatlining for lakers in the spring flatlining uh you know i'm really not a, a shallow water guy honestly i'm always almost always running uh some kind of weights snap weights lead core Lake George, in my opinion, is a really not a shallow water surface fishery. It's always clear. It's just gin clear water. It's fish. It's like fishing Lake Ontario when those guys have clear water in the spring. And it's tough, you know. Um, so I like to be down a little bit. Some sometimes I do, you know. I mean, especially ice out when it's really cold. Um, again, wet weather and wind. If you can take advantage of that chop. Those are days you can get away with putting more stuff up shallow and, you know, maybe running a little bit more gear. But uh, seem to be able to pull a cheater line in the rock wash. Um, at Lake George, it's, I don't know, it doesn't seem to work as well for me. Uh, I have guys tell me they do. Jamie Ellsworth, years ago, he swore and he caught all, and he was one of the best salmon fishermen ever on the lake. A lot of that stuff, you know, people will say, oh, I had a guy tell me that he used to hammer them on streamers back in the 80s. Well, back in the 80s, they used to hammer them on everything because there was a lot of fish to be hammered, you know? So right now, there's just not. So it's so inconclusive when you, you catch a salmon on, on fly, you know? If you caught 10 salmon on fly, yeah, you're onto something, but... A lot of times there's not 10 salmon to be caught in one day anymore. So there were just so many more fish around back then, you know, and uh, this whole seminar, you know, where are the fish? I mean, fish aren't hard to catch. They're, you're going to catch them on a variety of different things. It's just, you got to have them there to catch. Um, but yeah, flatlining. Maybe in the, co the colder time. Yeah. You know, right after ice out, uh, I'll usually have some stuff up high. You'll get some really big lakers up there, but it's not a real high percentage line for me. You know, Lake George, in my opinion, it's just a, it's a downrigger lake. It's clear. It's cold. Um, I I work my rely on my downriggers a lot. That's all. So never hooked the salmon, says Eugene, Eugenio Ramirez. I hope you do someday. Yeah, someday, my friend. Uh, and I, I will say, I fish Lake Champlain in the springtime. It's fun up there. You know, uh, it's just they have a really good salmon population. They have a, the lake trout are a blast. Uh, I could almost just talk about the two differences in the fisheries. And it's just when you start fishing a place like Champlain or Lake Ontario, they have really healthy fishery of a lot of other kinds of fish. So, you know, if you're going to target salmon, a place where there's a lot of salmon, it all starts to make sense to you a lot better. It might not be the same situation as Lake George. You, you might not be able to apply a lot of that. It might be different colors, different blah, blah, blah. But uh, when you go up there, you really, it, it, places like that will boost your confidence as a fisherman because they have a good population of fish. The lake trout up there, there's just, there's a lot of them. They're hungry. You know, you put three or four different things down. They're going to, pro you're probably going to catch lake trout on all of them. I'd say that's the biggest difference between Lake George and Lake Champlain. Um, not saying it's an easier place to fish because it's bare water. And, you know, I would, I went up there for the spring run. There's some good places of consistent salmon bite there, but uh, this year was different because basically we had that really warm period where it was 80 degrees for like, do you guys remember that? It was in 
early April, it was like 80 for like a week. And it warmed the whole lake up and the salmon didn't do what they usually do. So it was kind of tricky. Um, up there, you know, I have my network of people that I know that helped me out, pointed me in the right direction. That's important up there. You know, Lake George is a lot smaller. Generally, you know where the fish are going to be day to day. Up there, you know, you might be on a good salmon bite and then they move five or six miles in a couple days. Hey, we're getting them down here. But there are more of them, easier to target them. You know, the more fish, the more you're going to find that are hungry. So, uh, and it's a, the area I was fishing, Port Henry, uh, you can't see the fish until it's a foot under the surface of the water and net it. It's murkier water. I mean, you can hide a lot more crap in there. That's the time I get out cheaters, sliders, dipsy divers, and I just put a whole bunch of stuff in the water. You know, you can hide it. In Lake George, you, you do that, and the fish are like, ah! what's all, you know, you just don't need it. They can, they get behind your boat. Uh, you know, you have one or two lures down. They, are, they can see those 30 feet away. You don't need to put six down. Um, not that that's not going to work, but oftentimes you, ju you just don't need to. Um, whereas, you know, a place like Lake Champlain, those fish, I don't think they can see very far. So you want to put all that stuff in the water. So it's just a lot of fun up there, but it's a lot different. Every lake's different. Very different. No more questions, my friend. All right. so, cool. Thanks, guys. Like, thank you. Excellent presentation. You did uh, so well. Lots of good information. Anybody has any questions? Love talking about fishing. You can always um, type questions later, and uh, we'll forward them to Joe, or we'll try and answer them. Um, again, thank you. We'll, we'll yeah. Look forward to you doing another webinar. Yeah, we're gonna do a trolling one. For those of you that have tuned into this one, uh, I thought it'd be cool to just go through equipment, talk about planer boards, talk about, you know, just divers and just things that people, you know, if they want to get into trolling and they want to buy a planer board, there's so many, you know, what do you use for what species? So we'll get into that the next one. and help you out with that. So. There's all kinds of other uh, seminar classes that we'll be putting on. Look at the, the schedule on our website for the classes. And um, thank you for watching. Thanks, again, Joe. Great. Thanks, guys. Good night. Thanks for coming in, too, Mike. Mike, we have to the minute. Bill, like that. Oh, I missed it. Bill Kitchen for Keeley is. Gone now. Maybe you'll know that. I fished the bottom of this past week. Yeah. I caught some big rainbows.